That was my fault. I signed in before you did. Oh, okay. All right. So, um, welcome to our A to J Author Advanced User Forum. I'm Jessica Bolak Frank here at the Center for Access to Justice and Technology, and I have uh, John Mayer also is with us from Cali, and we're going to be talking a little bit about um, our A to J Author Five, the mobile design concept. And a quick reminder: you're all on mute on mute right now. If you want to be unmuted, um, just raise your hand and if you don't have a microphone, you can put the questions in the question box and I'll try and keep track of those. Um, and this session is being recorded and might be posted on our a2jauthor.org website or our new a 2 Author YouTube channel. Alright, so on the agenda today, we're going to talk about our mobile design concept and then a little bit about trainings for 2013 and what will work best for our development community, and then a little bit about our presentation at TIG that is a must-see. So, um, as we get started, John, feel free to jump in at any time about these. Um, I actually stole a lot of a lot of this information from John um, and what he's we've been working on in um, in the development team here. But so this is our mobile design concept. This is what we're hoping A to J author mobile viewer will look like for the end user. What we have here is the title screen. So this is going to be the first screen that appears um, when the A to J guided interview is loaded. It has our A to J logo, which we are in the process of uh, potentially redesigning. And um, the title of the interview will be on the first page. Our little avatar will be there. Um, the, so the title of the guided interview and also the legal aid organization, along with their website, will be on as well. And at the bottom of the screen, we have our little indication of the swipe to proceed, so telling the end user to move from right to left uh, to continue um, with it. The next screen that they'll see is the step screen. This um, is new to mobile. This is not in our standard A to J author uh, computer browser, but it's something we felt um, is needed for the mobile version. So it basically anchors users between the steps. Before the step, it'll show what step they're on, and then it'll kind of give them an outline of where they are. Um, it tells them, as you can see, step one, uh, one of 12, how many questions are in that step, and estimated time to complete it. On the uh, left is the shorter step name where the whole name fits in. On the right is a longer step name which might have to be tweaked a little um, to allow the end user to see the whole thing. Um, John, Let me jump in. Yeah, go ahead. Jessica, um, putting an estimated time of completion on any of these uh, guided interviews is, um, is, uh, is a fool's folly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because um, you know it's going to be different for every single person that takes this, and even even getting a even getting a, an accurate estimate, you know, is going to be um, nearly impossible to do. And, and mostly, I'm talking about for the longer interviews. You know, um, the, the the research in in mobile um, the research in mobile is you know things take as long as they take, um, and we're we're trying to do something. Um, a little bit unprecedented with with A to J Mobile in that trying to get somebody to spend a lot of time inside a mobile app. Um, you know the, the the average amount of time that people spend in a mobile app is about you know 18 seconds or something like that. Um, you know they go in they uh, you know use Google Maps or they go in and they look something up. They go in and they tweet or they go in and text. Um, uh, granted, people do read on their uh, mobile devices. I read books or uh, websites, you know, I'll spend uh, 20 minutes, you know, checking my email and things like that. But this is a situation where people are needing to, like, enter data. And so the, so the overall big design is one of um, uh, you, can, you can come in, you can get a little bit done, and then you can leave, and then you can come in a little bit later and get a little bit done and leave. In other words, we are, we're going to have to break up the long amount of time it takes to complete a form into a series of smaller steps. And so that's why there's going to need to be some points at which we stop and say, you know, this is going to take a little while to do some, um, to manage some expectations, you might say. Um, 
but the basic idea is if people are motivated or if this is their only way to get to uh, the web um, or this is their primary way to get to the web, you know, then they'll, they'll complete the form. You know, if, they, if they really need the, uh, the information or if they really need the, uh, the assistance, then they're motivated already to, uh, to work their way through it. So we've been having a discussion here in A2J out there about, um, like, do we keep it? Do we not keep it? How do we estimate the time? I personally like it, but I, I, I'm at least curious what, um, what other authors are thinking about it. So if you have any thoughts about um, what we've just been talking about, feel free to raise your hand. And we did have a question asking whether or not, um, just to clarify, that this is going to be a web application that's running within a mobile browser, and it's not a so-called like app. Like you're not going to go to the app store and download the A to J author app. This will be um, your the mobile device will recognize that, or A to J author website will recognize that you're coming from a mobile device, and it will run um, in in the browser on the on the smart device. Yep. One of, one of our thoughts was that we could, uh, we, we, we might, ex we, we are going to experiment with the idea that we can, we can look at the interview and say, oh, this is a text question. It has uh, 30 words. That's 15 seconds. Oh, this is a uh, data entry screen. It has, um, you know, five uh, blank things, um, you know, a minute and a half or something like that. In other words, we might be able to come up with an algorithm that counts words, counts screens, counts questions, counts, you know, all sorts of things. And then say, based on that, we're going to, you know, the, the machine says that this should take you 45 minutes or 25 minutes or something like that. Now, what that doesn't do, of course, is deal with the fact that people um, answer questions and then skip around large portions of interviews. Um, it doesn't deal with the fact that there's loops, right? How many children you have? You know, the person filling out the form with no children are going to get through it faster than the people who have uh, five children or something like that. Um, but that's why we're using the word estimate, right? You know, um, it's, it's the best you can do. Um, I mean, even the federal government uh, comes out with estimates for how long it takes you to fill out your taxes, and they perfectly well realize that everybody's situation is different. So so it's one of those sort of like a rough uh, estimate, maybe. All right, we have, um, I'm going to unmute you, Sun Kim, and feel free to jump in on this one. You're unmuted. Um, is there a way for you to actually estimate how long a person's been in a program, like past users, and then average that? Yeah, there actually is. And um, with Cali lessons, we do that because we want to measure how long it people it takes people to do things, right? Um, and so that that's a that's a great question because uh, uh, that that's, uh, I'm, we're going to try to work with LHI and see how, how whether or not we can do that. Um, it, it's interesting. We can we can we should be able to do that with almost no um, what what I call no cost. In other words, we're already going to be saving the user's information. It's no cost to add a timestamp. Um, and 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 literally add a timestamp on every um, you know on every uh, click or every swipe, so that we could actually say, well, look, they spent a lot of time on this question and only you know very little time on this question. Um, the only problem with this is is uh, parsing and uh, analyzing the data can can be quite um, it's it can be uh, like voodoo. You know, you you you. you if you 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 don't want to make too many assumptions based on too small a sample set, but but at well, least I it's mean, at least it's real data versus just guesses. Exactly. Know? I mean, I think if you did something like that in the beginning, it would be a little on the voodoo side. But as more users um, use an application, you would know it. You can average it out, and it would be better. So the more people who use something, the more you know you could tell them it's going to take ten minutes, or it'll take anywhere between you know ten to twenty minutes. Because I have programs that have like 300, 400 screens and a user will never see all of them but you know yep. for the most part you know it may take that user you know I don't know a half an hour maybe but another user could take another like 90 minutes depending on how many people are involved or that sort of thing and so you know 
I don't know, like, an, I, I guess, you no, know, you're right, more data is better. Um, so in the beginning, it'll be like, we're guessing, and we'll give you a number, but as the number, as time goes on and more people use it, then you can actually give them an actual number. Yeah, wouldn't that be cool? Matter of fact, you, I can even imagine where, you know, you pop up a statistic that's real time that says, you know, 300 people have done this interview before you, and the average time it took them was, you know, um, literally a calculation of that. We'll turn um, it into a game where they race to finish the interview <laughs> to beat right. the, the average. Beat the score, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, so can, I do, you, do you have at the beginning of some of your interviews, I've seen, like, this should take you, you know, on the opening basically screen, like, this is provided by so-and-so legal aid, and this should take you about 15 to 30 minutes to complete. Do you give an estimate at the beginning? Um, I never do in any of my programs because it's just, it's what you said, like, you don't know how many kids are involved, you don't know okay. how many guardians will be there, you don't know anything, and so, you know, if you tell them it's going to take 10 minutes, and it will if you only have one kid, but right. it's going to take you, you know, a good 40 minutes if you have one kid and six guardians and two yeah. standbys, and, you know, so it's not, um, it's it's kind of, you know, you, you don't want to you know, take the rug underneath them and say, but I thought it was only going to take 15 minutes and 40 minutes, an hour and a half. And, yep, you know, yep. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you don't want to give bad or, in, you know, uh, wrong expectations. You want to manage expectations. Um, and so that, that involves both, you know, misestimating in the wrong direction, in either direction. Exactly. Right. You also don't want to discourage people, right? This is going to take a half hour. Oh, forget it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I definitely don't want to tell them that there are 369 questions and stuff like that. <laughs> I would just kill them. And so I would never, ever, ever tell them that. Yeah. And so this is, this is actually, this whole conversation is a, is a wonderful illustration of, of a, you know, just one small issue. Uh, there's, there's a lot of potential interesting technology that we could do, and there's a lot of paths to explore. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to get this. Get this uh, product out the door. So, <laughs> so I expect that we'll we'll take a stab at something and then um, you know um, iterate uh, or improve over the future. You know, as we get smarter about this. So I'm gonna if if you don't have anything else, then I'm gonna re mute you. So let us know. Okay, and we had um, a question pop up from Mike Grinwald, who's um, in the sleep, vicinity of Sleeping Babies, so he can't uh, give this one himself. But um, his question was. I think giving an estimated time doesn't much um, help a user who probably pop back and forth while they're completing uh, the interview itself. So his suggestion was per perhaps a percent completed slash question remaining status indicator that might be more helpful. Uh huh. Um, I think he's he's absolutely right. It's, it, it, it's because uh, mobile apps are inherently you know back and forth type things. Like uh, I'm I'm trying to think. No, I, actually, I know this. Um, so I, I tried to find uh, mobile apps or, or any other situations where they tell you, well, this will take X amount of time. Um, the nearest thing is things like YouTube, right? You can see how many minutes a video is mm -hmm. um, or, or audio or podcast sometimes. Um, there, aren't, there aren't too many interactive programs. Certainly no games tell you you know, how long it's going to take. Like Angry Birds doesn't tell you this is going to suck your life away. <laughs> um, you know, estimated time, you know, four years. Okay, I'm not very good at Angry Birds. Um, but, 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 then they, but then it goes to Mike's second comment or second point, which is, you know, um, some type of progress indicator. You'll see that we've, we, we do have a, an example of a progress indicator in a, in a future uh, slide here. Um, but we probably could do better than that. That too is hard because it's uh, because of the looping problem or the the ability of us to count loops uh, mm -hmm. or or skipping around questions and things like that. But yeah, we're trying to figure out a an excellent uh, user feedback system for uh, for progress, and and obviously that would be useful not just in the mobile version but in the um, uh, desktop versions as well. All right, so Carolyn has, Robinson has her hand raised. Carolyn, I'm unmuting you now. Um, I, I, I think I feel pr pretty strongly that I can see where the incentive to get this progress and 12 steps and things are coming through. And I, I would second everything that everybody said so far. One of my concerns, again, about the time, and you sort of making a joke about Jessica is the game thing, is that 
we are we are working with low literacy people. We're we're targeting low literacy people, uh -huh. and the pressure they feel already about reading. I think to to say people do it in this much time can be can be intimidating and off-putting for them. So that, that's one of my concerns about the time issue. Like Sun, we have some interviews that could be two hours or they could be 20 minutes, depending. And one of the things that I tried, I, I'm not saying this is the solution, but in terms of steps, maybe it might, and I don't know enough about how other people develop, but one of the reasons ours is so long is we also have different forms. So maybe if it's an interview, um, we could give some information. We, I do a sort of an outline. These are the things that you're, we're going to do in this interview. And we, maybe we could come up, I mean, it would put more of the burden back on the developer, but sort of saying, this is what we have to accomplish. If these things apply to you, it will take longer. Think, I mean, if you have more, sort of like what someone was describing as more children or more guardians or something. Um, if you have rental property, if you're self-employed, you have rental property, you're going to have to fill in a couple of more forms than somebody else. If we can get, give an indication of the size, and then maybe not time and number of questions, but possibly steps. If we, if we come up with some sort of, everybody's going to have to do their own, but some idea of if we're using steps, um, we could say, you know, you're on the eighth out of, 10 to 12 steps and have already explained that maybe some people have more steps than others. Something like that. It's, it's, it's not as automatic. You can't program it at day to day. A developer would have to fit it in. But I, I, I worry about the pressure, the pressure on people who are, have low literacy. And then the, my concern is that there's something automated in there that might deter people and wouldn't be accurate. Good point, and and you bring up uh, points that will be um, uh, illustrated in in uh, future screens, uh, future slides. So, okay. um, and, and I think even Mike's next question, Jessica, co mm -hmm. is covered in, in sort of another screen. So why don't, why don't we just go to uh, uh, the next step, um, next screen? Okay. Do you want to describe it? No, I'm I'm leaving. This is your presentation, <laughs> Jessica. I want okay. to hear what you say about about it. <laughs> okay. So this is the um, pull down progress screen. And so that we're basically seeing this as a navigation tool. Um, it's a little bit more advanced than our current navigation tool at the top um, in the standard A to J guided interview. So it would be available, um, as I understand it, in all screens. They could pull down, as you can see the finger indicator. Um, that, that hand is not there, but it just gives you a sense of what a hand would look like in comparison to the screen. So the end user would pull down. The, um, the bar that says step 1 of 12, screen 12 of 20, um, and they'd be able to see with the green check, check plus, like, or check bars where, what they've completed, what steps they've completed, and then in pink here, um, or potentially grayed out in the middle um, screen grab, is the steps they still have to complete. And within each step, they would be able to see what questions need to be completed and jump to those um, to finish them. To go in order. Right. So, so notice that the um, ones with the uh, the green check boxes are active. This this replaces the uh, the back next button and the uh, pull down um, you know list of previously visited questions. Um, and notice you can you can tap on the the ones that have uh, the check the, the the green check box and that expands accordion like you know into all the questions that are underneath that step. And then the, uh, the the pinked out or the grayed out, you can't because that's the future. And you and as we know with time travel, you can only go backwards. Um, uh, and also a comment on colors and design. Yeah, the, these are these are only in, in in certain cases. You know, we're still working on a palette and on a design. And so sometimes some of these screens are just functionally uh, functional design rather than what they're actually going to look like because, yeah, I hate this too. Um, you know, it's pretty ugly, uh, even scary. Um, no, notice also on the, the far left one, it says step one of 12 and screen 12 of 20. That's the, that's the placeholder for some sort of numeric uh, progress indicator, right? There's 12 steps. 
there's happened to be 20 screens within step one. And so obviously that screen number will, you know, roll through all the, and a screen is, a, is the same as a question. Um, I hesitated to use the word question in this particular design just because not every screen is a question. Some of them are just uh, information or text or navigation or things like that. And the way I kind of see this progress bar is similar to on my phone when I get a notification that someone sent me a message on Facebook and I have an email and, you know, you just pull it down and then you can tap it to, to navigate within it. And I think that's going to be very familiar to people who have smartphones. Um, it's, it's instinctive and you do that already. So it's not like a scary feature that we're adding here. Um, yeah, as I was, you know, one of the things we were even thinking was, you know, because we know everything there is to know about the interview, maybe we can expose that to the, uh, to the developer, to the author. In other words, there would be some built-in runtime A to J um, uh, variables, such as the number of questions in this interview, or the number of questions in the step, um, the amount of time uh, people have already spent, um, I don't know, it gets a little weird when authors try to uh, change the behavior of the interview based on activity of the user um, too much because you sort of just don't know what they're, what they're doing. They, they might be taking a long time not because the interview takes a long time but because they, you know, answer a few questions and then they um, uh, you know, put down the phone to order their coffee or, or you know, do something else. In other words, um, and, and son, this, would, this goes to your question from before, it might be hard to, we, we might get massively inaccurate time estimates just by measuring how long people take because they may not, can, you know, they, 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 they may not go um, uh, from the beginning of the interview to the end of the interview. They may, you know, be doing lots of pausing and, and, and uh, going over to uh, another application or something like that. Uh, I'm not saying we don't try things, but I'm just saying that we also have to be careful of the pitfalls or of making false assumptions. That's a good point. They get a phone call in the middle and they're talking to their grandma for 30 minutes and that adds an extra 30 minutes to our runtime. So I'm going to go to the next screen here and show... Um, yeah, we're, gonna, we're never going to finish this. Yeah. <laughs> So this is our text screen. Basically, this is what it would look like on um, if there was long text, um, a, a question text. So um, this is actually broken up into three screens, and you can see it by the progress uh, dots at the bottom. It indicates how many screens they're going to have to swipe through to get to the end of this question. Um, and there is, obviously, with mobile, there's a certain break that you have to break up the pages. It would be an automatic thing. The author doesn't really have to think about necessarily um, breaking it up. And as you progress, the end user would just keep swiping through until the end. And then when they get to that last third dot question, if it was an actual question or there was a learn more, something like that, it would show up at the end. Right. So understand, no vertical scrolling. The goal here is if there's a if you if you as an author put um, uh, 55 pages of text. Uh, I'm thinking, I'm talking to you, Apple, and your uh, EULA. Um, uh, the user in the mobile version is not going to uh, vertically scroll through all of this text. Instead, the, the, the program is going to break it into a series of horizontal swipes with the little gray and black dots as indicators of how much more, how many more you have. You know, what, what's, what, what should be blowing your mind is, so now, so now we have three levels of, of hierarchy here, right? We have how many steps are there, 1 through 12, how many questions, and notice I use the word question on these screens as just a, a way to keep myself uh, thinking about what the right wording here, 1 through 3, and then each question can further be broken up into multiple screens depending on if there's an awful lot of uh, text that's in the question. Um, we sort of feel like it's the, it's, it, it's the, the, the swiftness of the horizontal, or what I would call the thumb swipe, you know, that, that makes this feel like a, a, a facile or a deft 
you know, and, and a fluid um, uh, user interface design. Yeah, so I'm going to go on to the, the entry screen because we're getting questions about what will checkboxes look like and what will radio buttons look like. So we'll move through those a little bit. So this is, this is our short text entry screen. So if you had a short question, like what is your full name? Instead of asking them, um, we've talked about this before, but instead of asking them, you know, tap, type their middle name, scroll down, tap, type their middle, the first name, tap, scroll down, middle name, tap, last name. We've broken it up into little parts. So each screen would ask a simple one bit of information. So we have the screen, the keyboard popping up in just the middle one, um, asking the middle name, but it's the same idea with the progress bars, uh, progress dots along the bottom, indicating how many screens need to be uh, completed for this question. Um, and you can see that it doesn't take up the whole screen itself, that the whole question isn't eaten up by the keyboard, but with just one bit of information at a time, only, um, you can still see the whole the whole thing and have the keyboard open at the same time. Yep. So we're, so it, it's interesting. This is the big picture here. Is this is a extension of the basic design of A to J, right? So you started with a form, which is on one page, and then A to J breaks that up not into one HTML page or one flash page, I guess, in the original one. But, but breaks it up into a series of questions for each, you know, in which you can ask, you know, uh, two or three things. Well, the mobile version extends that idea to say we're going we're gonna to break up even questions that have two or three data entry screens into one data entry screen per, uh, one data entry question per screen in, in order to, to uh, solve the problem of too much vertical scrolling and also the problem that when you have data entry, you lose a, a third of the screen to the keyboard. You know, um, and so, so in other words, there's you, there's never going to be a problem with the user typing and into the wrong box or having to tap the screen to to set focus into the box that they want because there will never be more than one box on the screen at the t at a time for for the typing to happen. Um, it's a it's a bit of a radical thing because um, I, I, uh, mo most of the applications that I've looked at that try to solve this problem, they let you do massive vertical scrolling. You know, think um, editing your contacts or, um, or even Twitter or email, right? You, you scroll and tap and scroll and tap to set focus. Um, I, I think we can make this work this way and it also keeps the fluidity going of the thing. John, do you see the question from Carolyn? Uh, I see all the questions, and by the way, the questions are awesome. This is great. We're gonna we're gonna save these, and uh, and if we don't actually you know get to answer all of them in this uh, situation, you know um, they're they're gonna be fantastic feedback for us. Um, may take time. Which which the, Caroline question? The what, the question is if the first screen says what is your full name, will they be tempted to type in their full name in what's really just the first name box because that's all they yeah. can see. Yeah, that's a great question. But no, notice that there's uh, inside the full name, inside the uh, the box, it says first name. And so the label that you uh, normally put outside the box has been internalized as a tap and disappear sort of thing. Um, this is this is actually uh, this actually illustrates the the biggest problem we have in this design, in that. The goal is is that you as authors won't have to do anything to change what you've done with existing interviews. That the mobile version will automatically or algorithmically, you know, convert what you've done and converts too strong a word. Will just display what you've done, but in a but in a in this mobile interface. Um, in the situation that you just described, well, what if people get confused by you know? The instruction on the screen, you know, because because you designed your interviews based on the idea that, that there's a full screen involved, and now we're in a different context. You know, there might be some confusion. Um, you're absolutely right, um, and and there's actually uh, uh, quite a few. There's a lot of little situations where that happens, um, and and there's some design elements to deal with it. But I, I think no matter what, it, we're, we're we're, we're going to run into user confusion problems at various places. Um, 
but because of the fluidity of the interface, you know, people can sort of quickly find out that they made a mistake. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to point those out if, as we go forward um, where, well, where we've done some things. And that makes sense, too. So if they do mistakenly type their, their full name into the first name box, when they swipe to the next screen and they see that it's asking for their middle name, they can always swipe back and change it in the first screen. It's not like an awkward, you know, click back. It's an easy movement of the thumb. Yeah, yeah. The, the app has to almost, well, like, like any app, the app will teach them, you know, what the right behavior is. You know, um, oh, okay, they're looking for first name. Okay, they're looking for middle name. Okay, they're looking for last name. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so let's go on to what it looks like if you're asking them to enter long text. So tell us your story. Explain, you know, why, whatever, you need a, a restraining order, something like that. So this is what it's going to look like, hopefully, in the mobile version, where they would be able to type freely, uh, click into the box, and then type their story freely. Um, it's, this is a challenging feature, um, and maybe there's a way we can work around that as a community, but it, it does require, I mean, they're completing it on their phones, um, and typing long things isn't necessarily common, but, I mean, people do their emails now, via typing and text long messages, that kind of thing. So it's not a completely foreign idea. Yeah, this is a good news, bad news screen, right? Here's the bad news. There's just nobody types long text on the screen, and there's no way we can make it better un until we start doing advanced technology like uh, text, uh, speech to text or something. Uh, here's the good news. Maybe this will stop people from typing too much into their <laughs> interviews. Like, you know, here's my here's my problem. All 97 pages of it. Um, you know, the, the 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 phone interface almost uh, forces people to be terse, um, and maybe that's not a bad thing in all situations. So you can get some awards from the court for for fixing people's answers a little bit. <laughs> um, and there was a question about the app supporting the landscape view in the browser? Yeah, not going to happen. Um, at least, uh, I mean, the, the, there are some, the, there, are, there are lots of apps. I, I took a look at lots of apps, and there are lots of apps that are portrait only. And uh, doing this design one way or the other, uh, it's hard enough to design it portrait view. Um, doing a, a landscape version actually doesn't solve any problems. Especially, you know, there are a couple of questions where it'd be nicer to be in landscape view, but then you've got the situation where people would be, you know, having to uh, move the phone, you know, as they go from question to question in an interview. Um, it just doesn't, uh, the, the benefit just doesn't seem worth it at this point. I'm open to discussion on that, but um, it's probably going to be a portrait only app. Okay, so I'm going to move, I, I see that we have a lot of questions, but I want to show you guys what our um, like radio buttons and check boxes look like, so if we can hold those questions till the end. Um, so here's what we have, dun dun dun, the radio buttons. The first screen on the left is um, how we first envision it. So this is what it would standard, kind of what is your legal malfunction, pick the option, however the big thumb comes in. And it's not even a problem with people with big thumbs. It's, it's a problem for everyone. The thumb is just huge in relation to the phone. So here is what the design concept is for the next three screens, or the next three um, screen grabs here. Sorry, I lost the screen here. Sorry, guys. Can you see it? Mine, mine blacked out. Yeah, it's kind of broken up. There, it's back. Okay. Now oh, you're back at the beginning. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, okay. Here we are. So um, it's instead of asking the end user to select with their thumb, which is their problem, instead it makes them into yes/no buttons. And is this your? What is your legal malfunction? Is it foreclosure? Yes or no? Is it a name change? Yes or no. Is it an eviction? Yes or no. And the default is to set them all to no. On the third screen, you can see that um, if they get to the end, if they go through all five and all five are selected no, they haven't picked anything yet, it'll pop up a thing that says you must choose one. And then the last screen, you can see um, if they've selected one of them, they can then skip to the end and don't have to go through all of the options themselves. 
Right, so this shows the difficulty of demonstrating, you know, a multi-screen um, app on a, in, a, in a static thing like PowerPoint. Um, but it's, 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 again, an extension of the same idea, which is to say um, we had the problem of, you know, if, of looking at uh, interviews in which had 10 or 15 or, or 5 or 10 um, or even three radio buttons. And radio buttons are little tiny things and, and your, your, your big finger, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to hit the right one. It's not that bad. You know, I'm not going to overstate it. Um, but we didn't want vertical scrolling. And so the solution was to say, well, each one of those radio buttons is actually a, a yes, no question. And in radio button situations, it's actually a, a yes, no question with no as the default. And then when you click yes, it's a skip to the end or wait, I want to look at the rest of them. And again, the, 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 we did some uh, paper prototypes. We did some paper prototypes where we, you know, tested going through long radio question, radio button questions, you know, five or ten um, uh, choices, and it's actually really fast, right? You know, especially after you do the first one and sort of get the idea of it, it's like yes, 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 or or it's no, 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 or since they're defaulting to no, you just swipe, 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 swipe. That's the one. Tap, swipe, 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 or that's the one. Tap, yes, skip to end, tap, and you're done. And, and it can actually feel quite fast. Um, so that's all I'll say. John, are you thinking of having, uh, one of the questions was, if they pick the first option, does that mean they'll never see the following options? Um, uh, yes and no. So, so if they skip to the end, then they wouldn't see the other options. But um, I don't know, did you, Jessica, did you include a, the, the, the post radio button slide? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, I have, think I have it on uh, checkboxes, so I'll go skip okay. to that one. Yeah. So we'll answer that question when we get to checkboxes. Yeah. Here's so the, yeah, here's what checkboxes look like. Same idea. Instead of here's the giant hand again trying to select one of those little tiny boxes. Especially if there's there's like two options, they're bigger, it's easier. But if there's like ten options, it's harder um, to pick the correct one. So, like John was talking about, at the very last screen on the right here would be, here's what you picked. Here's the ones, here's the options that you selected. Um, and it, it gives them a refresh, and they can either go forward or they can go backward to change the options um, that they've put up there. Yeah. So this is, a, this is an example of a problem uh, in text, sorry, in a mobile design uh, generally, which is it's, it's because of the smaller screen, it's very easy to lose your context. You know, where am I? What am I doing? You know, um, and so there's a whole bunch of like little, sort of like little um, divergence off the path uh, that, that and, and so you, you end up adding more screens or more information that sort of reset the user back into where they are. So, so here's a list of things. You know, what types of uh, the, the far left one on the screen right now. Um, those are broken down into a series of yes, no questions. In the case of checkboxes, right, we don't want to, we probably want to default them to no, but you can tap, tap yes on multiple ones. There's no skip to the end in this case. And then when they're done, show them what they've done. And then they can swipe backwards if they wanted to add an, a yes or change a no. Or they could swipe forward and backwards and forwards is left and right. I think here, Wait, uh, I'll, I'll get that orientation right in, in my head eventually, um, and 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 they're done. Now the, now the question about whether they can see all the choices—that's actually a great idea. I hadn't thought of that. Maybe we should show them the you're about to look at these ten choices. In other words, a compact view as an opening version of the question, and then a series of yes nos. And then uh, this is what you just did with the, you know, left, right swipe allowing them to go fix anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go on to our learn more. So this was, as I understand it, John, kind of an issue here um, with the learn more, trying to figure out how learn mores are going to progress, how they pop up, because on the regular viewer, it's there on the right-hand side. The end user can, um, it doesn't necessarily interrupt the flow of the questions, and they can see it and they can tap it if they want it, but they don't have to. So what we're seeing here on the screen, this would um, appear after the question, 
and it would pop up and say learn more and this would be the learn more question text. So it would be like, what do you mean by income? Tap to learn more. Um, if, they, if they don't have a question about income or they don't want to go on, the end user can just swipe to skip the learn more altogether. If they did want to learn more, they would hit that yellow tap to learn more button and whatever would pop up, the video, the audio, the picture of it, the explanation, whatever you put into the learn more answer section would pop up. Right. Learn more is, is optional text, but having said that, there is some text that's part of the learn more that's not optional, right? It's on the screen in the big screen view. So when, when do we show that to the user in a situation, in a mobile situation, when you've also got a bunch of text that's in the, uh, the text of the, of the question, right? And so uh, I have this worked out in a, as, a, as a sort of a flow chart in, in, uh, in, in my head and, and um, um, illustrated in, in one of the slides. Um, but it's actually a little bit tricky. This is, a, this is also an illustration of that context, the, the losing context problem, you know, because you can't have the learn more on the screen at the same time. We could do like a, a fade in, we could do a slide in and a slide out. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what the best way to do this is. This is a, uh, this is one shot at it. And, um, you know, I think we're going to end up experimenting with um, different designs here to, to try to get it right. Uh, same goes for for pop-ups. You know, pop-ups are just like you know uh, spontaneous learn mores. You know, so yeah. here's the example of the pop-up screen as well, where the the word button would be the pop-up word, and then they would hit it, and it would pop up in a different screen. But I think with the learn mores, that's a lot of how end users maybe read the question. They read the whole question on the left, and then they look to the right and see the the learn more. So it's not having it after the question isn't necessarily not intrinsic to the way they're reading it already on the main screen. But um, so here, here are the pop-ups and um, I didn't include your flow charts, John, but so it would be the same idea. No, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's, we're, we're, we're already uh, 45 minutes into this, so um, uh, there'll be more information on that in a future webinar or um, when, I, when I write this up as a design. And actually, it's hard to talk about this. It's much easier for you if you uh, speaking to you authors, if you could actually see it in action. And, and, um, and so we're, as quickly as possible, I want to get to the point where we're playing with the prototype such that, um, um, you know, we can experiment and iterate over different ideas with, with like a live ammo instead of, uh, you know, these just sort of like pictures on a screen. Um, but we're going to, we're going to, we've still got a few more rounds of pictures on a screen or paper prototypes because we don't want to implement, we don't want to waste a lot of time implementing something that we end up tossing out. All right, um, so since we're running short on time, I'm going to kind of go through the next couple screens just to give you guys a hint. That's, um, okay, John. Go ahead. Um, so our next one is dates and calendar. So it's two <laughs> different options that um, we're thinking about. And John actually came up with like 10 different options, but I didn't want to um, scare you all with it. So um, here's ideas where you would type it in, you know, what is your birthday? And in the grayed out background, it gives an indication of, you know, month, date, year. Another option on the right is um, where the end user would tap and they could scroll through, um, you know, the months, tap the middle one, scroll through the month days. And yeah, it's then called a spinner. Spinner, sorry, yeah, the spinner. No That's scrolling. Right. No scrolling. Well, it, it is like a scroll, but it's like a scroll in place. Um, I, didn't, I didn't have a good example of a, or I did have good examples of spinners that like, for like how you set your alarm on your yep. iPhone and stuff, but um, uh, I didn't have a good example of, of a date version of that. Um, and it, it's kind of tricky with someone whose birthday might be in, you know, their, the year they were born, you know, 1935, having to spin through um, all the way, where it would obviously be easier when it's, you know, you're younger, a younger birthday. Yeah, it turns out uh, date questions, well, this is something that you all know already, authors. Um, date questions come in different flavors, right? A what is your birthday question is a precise number, right? We all know our birthday, but it's also a distant date. So you pop up one of, uh, you pop up a calendar, you know, and what do they have to do? They have to tap the back year button, you know, in my case, um, you know, 51 times. 
You know, that's not a good interface. Um, the other the other dates are like, you know, your court date is next Tuesday. Type in next Tuesday's date. You know, typing, thinking in your head what next Tuesday's date is actually hard for me. Actually, it's easy, right? It's uh, it's Christmas. Um, uh, this 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 week it's easy, um, but but it's better to pop up a calendar, a monthly calendar, and just say tap on you know we're on the Tuesday number of next week. So I so this this is actually and I'm and I'm I'm waxing poetic again, right? Working on this mobile design has has uh, revealed to me more interesting information about how people interact with uh, forms, you know, and it's not. So in other words, dates are not just dates. Dates are uh, contextual. There's there's birth date dates. There's um, appointment dates. There's deadline dates. There's uh, you know when you have to uh, plan for stuff dates. You know and things like that. And maybe we need to change the um, the tool so that authors have different uh, interface options to give users based on the, the, the context of the date or the type of date that it is. I guess that's what I'm saying. We, I learned something, and that's a good thing. Here is another um, one that we've talked about a lot, too, the numeric field and calculator and whether keeping, um, for if we were going to go with the, the date where you type in the number, does it always look like a calculator to give them kind of the unified design feature throughout, no matter what kind of number they're putting in? So these are ideas for allowing people to do you know, simple math, um, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction within the interface itself. So this is what income. Yeah. Uh, does it, does it, did anybody else know that, the, uh, that a calculator buttons are different from a phone pad buttons? You know? I, I, I guess I knew that intellectually, but, I, but as I was doing this, I'm like, I, I would rather give people the same numeric keypad no matter what they're typing, just because their muscle memory will always remember. Um, you know, and it, it makes sense that if any time you're typing a number, just make it a calculator automatically. You know, if they want to, you know, add up the numbers. You know, and then if it's if it's a not if it's a non-numeric number, like a like you're ty you're entering your social security number or a phone number, then you just um, you know gray out the calculator functions or something like that. Yeah. Um. All right, so on to buttons. This, similar to how we had the um, checkboxes and radio buttons broken up, it, again, it has, you must choose one. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to choose that kind of thing. So the key design is just to make them as big as possible. So with buttons in A to J author now, you're limited to three as it is. So here's what three would, would look like um, on the screen. Yeah, big, fat, fat finger buttons. Yeah. Um, another neat feature is the pull-down list. So what county do you live in? This is like those XML lists for states or counties or courthouses or something like that. Um, and the end user here is a scroll um, down to be able to go through what here what county um, they are. Yeah, breaking my rule here. So here's, so here's where vertical scrolling is allowed because of uh, long XML lists. Um, you know, you, usually, if it's less than 10, you guys will use a radio button. If it's more than 10, then you're, then you're going to use an XML list or a pull-down list. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the place I see it most commonly is, you know, pick your county or pick your um, uh, zip code or something like that. You know, and it makes sense in this case, again, people lose context, to have a, uh, a confirmation screen, you know, something we don't have in the full screen version of A to J. You know, this would be inserted that says, so you chose this one. You know, if you got it right, you're, you're done. Swipe away. And if you didn't, then swipe back and, you know, pick the right one. Mm -hmm. And then in, um, here's how images and videos would show up. Similar, uh, they go in the Learn Mores. So just like we talked about in the Learn More section, um, they would have the option to watch the video, tap to view it, and it opens in full screen. Or, you know, tap the image. Um, tap to view the image, and that would open up in full screen as well. Or they could always skip it. Yeah, and here, here I may, we may break, uh, break another rule, which is to say this might be the only place where we'll allow uh, landscape mode because um, Im, uh, images and, vi and video work so much better in landscape mode mm -hmm. on, uh, on smartphones. 
So maybe you can turn your phone sideways here and it will automatically reorient and you can get a bigger uh, picture of that. Um, there is a problem with video, right? People are on mobile devices and sometimes they're on mobile data plans. And so, you know, you stick a 30 meg video in there that, that is fine on a desktop version, you know, and, and there they are watching it and using up their entire month's allocation of data. You know, the question in my mind is do we need to, um, you know, are you sure you want to watch this or this is 30 meg or something? You know, on the other hand, you know, I, I have a feeling it's just not an issue. I mean, people just people just do stuff on their phone and, and don't need to be, we don't need to uh, be uh, coddling them too much in regards to, um, you know, uh, data rates and stuff like that. And we also talked about in our last um, advanced user call in October that, you know, a lot of people aren't using video right now. Um, so maybe it's not necessarily an issue right now. Yeah, but I think it will become more prevalent. So, mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of if there is video with the audio section of it, audio um, is able to be turned on and off. So here's what it would look like um, with audio on, audio off, playing at the bottom, them able to pause it, that kind of thing. Right, right. For those of you that that use the feature in A to J that allows you to have an MP3 file associated with every question that reads the question to them, this is a, also a uh, an accessibility thing, right? Um, but you also need to be able to turn the audio off, and so uh, there's there's both uh, you know the audio that you could turn off of the one you're listening to. That's the lower right hand screen um, audio button, and then you also need to be able to turn sound off for the entire interview. And that's the upper right hand one, and that probably has to be a a permanent feature of the uh, of the interface. Um, you know, it wasn't it didn't show. And, I didn't do it. I didn't do the sound page until uh, near the end of my design work, and so I didn't. And I didn't re-add the audio uh, control button back into uh, the previous screens, but it would probably be there. Oh yeah. Um, and then just before we go into any questions you guys have, I just want to jump through to. Um, Oh, I'm sure nobody has any questions. No, no, they're not filling up the question box at all. <laughs> um, I have some questions about trainings for you guys um, for 2013. Obviously, we're going to have a new A to J Author 5.0, and um, we'll have a ton of trainings on how that, how it works, how to do certain features, how to do things you used to do in the old one and the new one. But I'm wondering what works best. Um, specifically for new and advanced. Um, for the new user trainings, we do it once a month now. Does it need to be more frequently? Try and remember back to when you guys are all newbies. Um, and then with the advanced user forums, we're doing it every month now, every other month. Um, does it need to be every quarter? Do we need to do it in the beginning because we'll have so many new user trainings? Um, should it be open discussion? Should it be presentation? Should we look to highlight specific projects people are working on? So um, if you don't feel like jumping in right now, feel free to shoot me emails about your suggestions for the trainings because we want to make them um, as useful for you guys as they can be. So um, on that front, we'll just we'll skip that. Feel free to shoot me an email about those. And then our TIG conference presentation, um, I know many of you will be there. We're going to have uh, session one on Wednesday at 1030 to 1145, capturing the untapped resource using law students to create A to J guided interviews. Um, Ron Stout, John, and I will be there, and we'll talk a little bit. You'll, you might see some of the same I, things you've seen today, but you can maybe ask your questions to John in person. I just threw you under the bus there, John. <laughs> They'll be bombarded with questions. Um, oh, I expect it to be, uh, expect, it's, it's going to be worse than that. We're going to try to show the, uh, the authoring side of this as well. Um, um, but the, that design is, um, is even more, um, um, difficult because you know we need to both preserve the capabilities of the uh, of the flash version, and we uh, you know we 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 like you want to add so many cool features, and we're needing to uh, you know just get you know the first version out, and then um, you know worry about adding more features as we go. And there was a question if we could webinar the presentation. Um, I think we could, right, John? Or at least uh, video record it, and then um, I can edit out any other people's stuff. I think what we'll, what what we'll definitely do is uh, record uh, audio, record it, and then we can um, 
uh, mix it back into the um, uh, the PowerPoint as a webinar, if you as like a, a screencast. That's one way to do it. Um, yeah, videotaping is is hard because it's hard to get the person in the screen, and really all you want to do is listen and watch the PowerPoints anyhow. So yeah, so we'll definitely at least record it, so you can go back and listen to it if you can't. Yeah, um, be on there. So that's all I have. Um, if you guys have questions or feedback, um, you want to raise your hand. We have like two minutes left, um, but if you do have anything, feel free obviously to shoot us shoot it in out there an email, and I can pass them on to John. Yeah, I'll, I'll grab. I'll jump in and grab some of these questions. So, Carol, Carol, first of all, thank you. These are great questions. Um, she asks, uh, "Is it possible to have A to J author decide whether or not to display the sound button? Whether uh, whether to have the author, I assume, dis display the sound button, depending on whether or not the interview has audio files? Yes, of course. If there's no audio, then you don't have to display the the sound button at all. That would be automatic, I would imagine. Um, uh, Bunch of people asking questions about dates. A date validation feature, oh, would that be awesome, wouldn't it? Um, as a matter of fact, it would be awesome if there were um, some extensive date validation such, I mean, the minimum would be you, you can't enter an incorrect date. Um, I think we can get that easy, um, but, the, but better would be better control or maybe more fine-tuned control over um, uh, date programming. Now, having said that, and been a programmer uh, for you know 20 years, I, I, I will say that the hardest thing to get perfectly right inside any programming language is dates. Um, it, there's always exceptions. There's you know stupid leap years. There's you know the the, the Europeans show up and they mix up the <laughs> month and day. You know there's people that want. You know, programmers want dates to be year, month, day. Why? Because when you sort, then you get date order. But humans want, or at least Americans want, you know, month, uh, year, day. I'm sorry, month, day, year. You know, and then there's the whole Y2K thing, which all of us programmers are guilty of. All of, I'm just, I'm just going on a rant here that um, I would love to see a, a wonderful, perfect handling of dates in the authoring and in the user interface. And then I'm at, with us to the same breath. I'm saying it's awfully hard to do that. Just, just I, I mean, the devil's in the details. Yeah. Um, I've heard that general people type in numbers rather than selecting. Yes, absolutely. You know, and that's how we had it in original A to J. And then when we asked for features, people said, "Oh, we want a calendar," and it made sense. So we give them a calendar. And then people are like, "Well, you know, calendar doesn't work for entering certain types of dates." And so what that is is an illustration of the fact that sometimes uh, we, we learn our lessons not because we're smart, um, but, but, but because we're observant. And that we, we try something and it works and then, we, and then a situation pops up that teaches us that, oh yeah, tapping the back ear button 51 times would be pretty crappy. You know, instead we need, uh, you know, just, just let them type the number in. You know, so that almost implies that the interface should have both a calendar on it and a keypad on it, right? The number, the number keypad. Um, well, then, then you're getting a really cluttered interface, right? Because especially in a mobile situation, so you have to uh, make choices. Is all I'm saying. Um, thank you, Mike. Mike says, looks like a fabulous start. New navigation puts even greater requirements on how repeat loops collect information. Oh, yeah. You betcha, Carolyn. Because one cannot reset the count poses problems already with this uh, version. Transparent new navigation display means it's harder to allow users to reset their other loops. Yeah, the, 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 the back button has always been a, a difficult thing because, you know, do you, do, you, do you just back up over the question or do you back through the loops? you know, one question at a time. Um, and, and I guess the way to think, the, the way, the, what guides me is I think, I'm a user, what, one, what do I expect? Um, and then I think, I'm, I'm not John Mayer with a master's degree in computer science user. I'm, you know, um, I'm an immigrant. I haven't finished high school. I do have a phone, and so I understand how this, you know, you tap and you use it. But you know what I mean? I, I, I got to not think like a programmer when I'm looking at it. And I need to get feedback from other people because sometimes you can't set aside your 
your design biases. And that's why we're going to be doing lots of, I mean, I've been showing this to lots of people. We gave a presentation at NLADA uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, I, gra I drag people in. We do what, what we call, um, you know, um, low rent usability testing with, uh, uh, with law students. Unfortunately, um, it, it, it's, this, this is going to sound funny. Our access to poor people is limited. I, it, it, and so we, we almost need to find a situation where we can get people who are like the most typical users of uh, LHI or, or A to J interviews. Um, you know, I, I, I exist inside of a, a university system, and so, and so everybody's smart, or at least everybody's got more than a high, a high school education. And so I need to be, and so, so the first step in, in improving the design is, is being aware of those, um, uh, those biases, I guess, to, to, to hopefully uh, design, design around them. That's all I got to say, and it's twelve oh three. So, um, uh, all right, well, there will be there will be more opportunities to uh, talk. I'm sure on this. Definitely. So, um, if you guys want to follow up on any of those questions or um, any of the training suggestions, let me know. And my email's here on the screen. And also a big thanks to Callie for our go-to meeting services and John for um, giving us insight into A to J Author five point oh. So, thanks everyone. Thanks, folks. Bye bye. Happy holidays. <laughs>